Welcome to another law video and with update 14 happening in just a few days time on Tuesday the 29th of November the story is being set up for whatever new stuff the update might bring. The big event is the attempt by the Kingfisher to contact one of the Stargoids and as usual this video is chaptered so you can skip straight to the logs from the ship or bear with me as I run through the sequence of events that have led us here and some of the thoughts that people have had about them. So it started with this article with Albertesro, Ishmael Palin and Ramtar all releasing a joint statement about the Thargoid Roar. Thanks to uh, Shojin A, formerly known as uh, D2, and the implant in her head, they've managed to isolate some of the frequencies from the multi-frequency signal that is the Thargoid Roar. And she has interpreted the bit she can understand as, we see them, we are coming. Further analysis, um, they're saying, has concluded that this is coming from a single entity transmitting more power than anything previously detected. So that would definitely fit in with the Stargoids, which are like nothing we've seen before. So some people assume them is us, humanity, as in we see them, they've gone too far this time, we're on our way. And it's obvious this is how the people in the in-game galaxy think. But independent commanders and I myself am not so sure about that. So in context, this sounds like the Thargoids noticing something they haven't before. And that doesn't make a lot of sense for it to be us, because we've been at war with them for five years. So what else could it refer to? Well, the obvious candidate is the Guardians. But it can't just be about detecting Guardian technology. The Thargoids must be aware of us using Guardian weapons against them. We've killed thousands of Goids with plasma cannons, shard cannons and Guardian gauss cannons. So they know that we're using Guardian weapons against them. We've killed thousands of Thargoids with them and they don't seem to be too fussed about it. As if numbers and casualties don't mean that much to them. Which again is in line with the whole hive mind theory where masses of individuals dying doesn't matter as long as the collective survives. So if just killing them with Guardian weapons isn't enough to trigger this kind of reaction, then what is it? And I wouldn't have thought it would be just us using Guardian weapons, because if it was going to trigger this kind of reaction, it would have happened by now. So was it the sheer amount of Guardian objects that we used in the Proteus Wave weapon? It was the largest collection of Guardian items in one place. Did that make the Thargoids realise they were part of a bigger plan, that rather than turning these things into individual guns, it was turning them into one big gun? Or was it the fact that they were using one of the Thargoids' own bases to amplify the weapon? This is the most likely explanation to me. Using weapons with a bit of Guardian technology and even gaining the ability to modify them a bit like Salvation did is one thing, but interfacing them with a Thargoid site to amplify the effect of those weapons? That seems to be the most likely thing to me, to trigger the Stargoids to step in. And it also fits with the idea that, as I've been saying for a while now, the same symbols are now showing on every Guardian obelisk everywhere. And, you know, my little hunch there is that it represents some kind of ancient network activating. This could also have been detected and could be another trigger for the Stargoids to step in. Another update to the FSS scanner has been given to everyone, which helps to further pinpoint the Stargoids and confirms that the rogue signal sources do come from them. Although we all know the Stargoids won't appear until at least the update at the end of the month. The alien nature of their travel through space and our scanners needing to have their recalibration software upgraded before we can properly track them from our ships it's a nice way to roleplay it, even if commanders, being commanders, are demanding more hard data than that. Laurie Jameson, the engineer, is not confident it will ease anybody's concerns, though, and urges people to use the scanners for themselves and draw their own conclusions. This is something that none of the critics have done in this next article, which is rejecting any suggestion that the Stargoids are hostile. We've got a dismissal of Sho Jin A's interpretation of the Thargoid roar, calling it a vague instinct. A chip in her head that was designed to interface with Thargoid systems is not just a vague instinct. So this comes across as uh, scientifically ignorant and patronising. 
that article and this one shows just how quick people are to claim support for Tesro Palin and Ramtar one minute and then turn on them the moment they say something scientifically neutral and honest like we can't make assumptions about friendliness and because it's not what they want to hear they even go so far as to perform character assassination on Palin and try to discredit him for his alleged communication skills you know um, playing the man not the ball if you don't have a scientific argument try and discredit the person saying it it's pretty disgusting really how quickly these people are ready to turn on those who are probably going to be the ones to deliver the communication that they want Palin's opinion that humanity may not be ready for what happens next has been criticised as needlessly alarming says the same person who also says no superpower has announced a means to prevent the Thargoid anomalies from reaching us had any of these people flown out to see the Thargoids for themselves they would know that near them are a number of Thargoid signal sources non-human signal sources and in the last video I had to give out a warning that players are reporting hostile high predictions in the systems where the Thargoids are passing but apart from that there's no evidence of hostile activity right well that doesn't take peace off the table but it does mean anyone claiming there's no hard evidence for hostility is talking rubbish anyone can prove it wrong simply by flying there and seeing what happens so the only thing these people are really showing is their own ignorance the interesting part in this article for possible future gameplay is we're told Vista Genomics could soon be paying more for samples now that's good news for explorers because finding them can be very time consuming but what else does this hint at? At the moment there are no Thargoid items that you can use a genetic sampling tool on. So could this be another hint at Thargoids on the ground or new materials on planets and moons to discover? Why bother linking Vista Genomics to Palin's research team with the aim of sharing databases in the same article if it's entirely disconnected to his work with Tesro and Ramtar? Is this just the scientific community cooperating as a sensible thing to do, or is there more to it? Either way, it'll be nice to get paid more for getting to your planetary samples, so that's something to look forward to. Other effects of a Thargoid attack are discussed in financial terms with a possible recession on the way and goods fluctuating wildly in price. I don't want to go into a heavy financial analysis here, so I'll just summarise the current thinking by people like Ian Doncaster and various other people who closely monitor the BGS. And they all seem to agree that basically to cause a recession, you can't just do random attacks. So let's take a hypothetical look with some ballpark figures at what would happen if, let's say, 200 systems are attacked all at once and there are 20,000 systems with some kind of industry. Each industry is well enough represented and spread out across the bubble for it to survive with minimal losses. The poor people in those systems will get hammered with famine and infrastructure failure, probably killing off millions on top of however many the Thargoids have killed already. And that's obviously appalling. But the other 19,800 systems will only be slightly affected. Supply lines to those systems will change but not vanish prices will fluctuate for a while then settle again harsh as it seems the overall economy won't be that affected so then what about targeting specific industries to cripple a vital sector of the economy well again industries like extraction refinery and industrial are scattered everywhere and even outside the bubble so again although it's horrible to casually dismiss millions of lives like this from a purely economic perspective, they have a lot of built-in redundancy, as it were, with plenty of systems ready to take up the slack if a few go down. 200 systems out of 20,000 is only 1% of the economy. So the best target to cripple the economy would be to hit the high-tech systems. Now a targeted attack on 200 high-tech systems would have a much more devastating effect because those systems provide essential commodities to all the others. The BGS gurus have calculated that it could cut out a sixth of the production capability of the entire bubble, and it would also take a lot longer to recover, during which time 
we would be even less technologically prepared for the future, and of course, more vulnerable to future attacks. This would also include many systems selling the commodities needed to repair stations, because stations themselves are the end product of high technological achievement, and they rely on high technology to maintain them. Attacking systems providing the underlying technology would make any damage to them harder and more expensive to fix if they get attacked. All of that's hypothetical, of course, and it assumes that the Thargoids would know, care, or understand our economy, and there's no reason to think they do. But it's being mentioned because to actually cause a galaxy-wide recession would be pretty difficult, so it seems unrealistic to expect that any Thargoid attack, no matter how heavy, would really do it. They'd have to hit the whole bubble at once, and that seems incredibly unlikely. Prices wildly fluctuating in clusters of systems near an attack seems likely, but a galactic-wide recession? Less so. That said, the idea of the Stargoids making more targeted attacks on our technology isn't so crazy. We've already seen the Thargoids adapting to our technology, so developing ways to specifically attack our technology isn't such a big stretch. While the Thargoids themselves are being tracked, what are the regular Thargoids up to? Well, the Colsac sector is reporting a build-up of non-human signal sources again, and this is tied by the article about it to the build-up of signals in the California Nebula from a couple of weeks ago. And again, there's been nothing specifically attacked, just the increased Thargoid presence. No AX conflict zones, no stations on fire, just the same build-up of non-human signal sources as if they're watching or performing some kind of reconnaissance. Non-Guardian anti-Xeno weapons have been given a buff to their damage, so the human-made missiles and multi-cannons should work better against Thargoid interceptors than they did before. They still won't be as effective as Guardian weapons, but nevertheless an improvement to them is welcome for those who want to have a little crack at it before doing the Guardian grind, if they're going to do the Guardian grind. Azimuth's megaship, the Glorious Prospect, the one giving out the Mbuni permit that they got from the Trade CG a couple of weeks ago in Wandrama, has left t Tori now and set up in LHS-1163. It was escorted by the Fednex to its new location, and the Salvation Modified Weapons are available for purchase again at Prospects Deep in Mbuni. The Kingfisher, the megaship built by the Campaign for Peace led by Dalton Chase, ran a community goal to get supplies and the community goal ended on Tuesday instead of the usual Thursday because their intention was to fly out on Wednesday to the Hyades sector and intercept one of the Starcoids on Thursday. Ironically, despite all the efforts of people to track the Stargoids and predicting where they go next, that's always involved some guesswork because we're not given enough information to pin them down any more accurately than it allows us to, and of course, FDEV could change their speed and direction at any time. So faith in calculation can only ever go so far when the other side of the equation can be changed at will. So this was an obvious plot-driven decision for the Kingfisher to know with such certainty where one of them would be a few days in advance. On Wednesday, the Kingfisher took off for the permit lock system in the Hyades sector, and Dalton had managed to use his connections to wangle a temporary permit to get there. They intend to intercept one of the Stargoids, which they have named Tyrannis, after the Celtic god of thunder and the wheel, specifically a wheel with eight spokes. Their plan was to broadcast mathematical equations, star charts and similar information they describe as being universally recognisable in an attempt to show the Thargoids that we are a reasoning species and not just killers. Dalton himself didn't go, and neither did the deputy editor of The Sovereign, which has amused people and made them wonder if they really have the courage of their convictions. We're behind you, 118.82 light years behind you. Joy Sen, whose podcast interviews with the Thargoid Advocacy Project we heard a few weeks ago, she wanted to be on board to broadcast live but got told they want no transmissions other than the ones they're sending to the Stargoid in case they confuse the message. And then just before the Thursday morning update, reports started coming in from AXI and Canon, amongst others, saying that the Kingfisher had been destroyed. 
Players also noticed they had been given a permit, simply called Odyssey Testing Permit, which allowed them to go into the system in the high 80s sector to see the wreckage for themselves, and pictures started being circulated about 7.30 in the morning of the destroyed Kingfisher. And then shortly after the Thursday morning update, a Galnet article appeared saying the communication with the Kingfisher had been lost. There are now some logs to read at the wreckage of the Kingfisher. Be careful getting these. If you drop in at the Kingfisher or anywhere else in the system, if you drop into normal space, Thargoids will appear and come for you. Be aware of that. But there are three ship uplinks to scan with your data scanner. And from them, you get three logs. And here are those logs. What to say, what to say. I suppose I should start at the beginning. <clears throat> this is Dr. Elias Pope, standing aboard the Kingfisher. The megaship smells brand new. All aerosol sprays and adhesives. Our research equipment is current generation. Even the corridors have been polished. Alton Chase sure kept his word. Everyone on board is excited about the mission ahead of us. We've been given the chance to make history. This ship, carrying over 3,000 supporters of the Thargoid Advocacy Project, aims to greet the first of the rogue anomalies headed towards the core systems. Tyrannus. We want the first human ship it meets to be one of peace, not war. My role is to lead the team seeking to open communications with the Thargoids. Now, we're hardly going to strike up a conversation anytime soon. We don't even know whether the aliens recognize human communication methods, but we have some ideas. There are multiple methods of sending messages without a shared language. My team has proposed various data sequences, audio cues, light patterns, and such. If we can establish any level of response, then we'll have something to work with. Imagine the incredible opportunities for both our species if we can make contact. True contact. Not just an exchange of weapons fire. If they hurt us... <laughs> I get goosebumps just thinking about it. Our jump to intercept Tyrannus is scheduled for an hour's time. I'll update when we arrive. We've reached our destination in Hyades Sector YOQB51 and started our observations. So far, we've been unable to make much headway. The Tyrannus signal has decelerated, but our calculations indicate it will still pass us by at a velocity too fast for any meaningful contact unless we get its attention. We're transmitting algorithmic comms, binary encoded hails, and a series of harmonized whistles that don't occur naturally in the galaxy's electromagnetic makeup. Too little noticeable effect, I should add. Our readings confirm Professor Palin's theory that the signal source is massive. If our estimates are correct, Tyrannus dwarfs any man-made starport. We remain hopeful that the signal has a non-military purpose, but we cannot ascertain its motives through long-range scans alone. Mood aboard the Kingfisher is apprehensive. I believe it is dawning upon the crew that while we truly wish to make peaceful contact, Thargoids themselves may not be listening. I have to admit, I'm beginning to wonder whether we made the right decision by coming here. If only we had a sign that our efforts meant something. This is Dr. Elias Pope. I'm standing on the bridge of the Kingfisher. If you're receiving this transmission, we need federal authorities to cancel system access restrictions. Send help immediately. The ship has been attacked by multiple Thargoid vessels. They swarm the system as Tyrannus passed through. We are defenseless. After days of silence, we heard a noise from the Tyrannus signal moments before it entered the system. 
I don't have time to analyze it properly, but the Firebird ships appeared moments later. This mission was doomed from the start. We hoped they would listen, but... I don't know whether I should use one of the remaining escape pods. The helmsman claimed they saw others that were jettisoned being collected by Firebird ships. My assistant, she's... She's praying to a god she doesn't believe in for a miracle that can't happen. I'm thinking of joining her. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Commanders are finding Thargoid sensors in the cargo racks. Not always, you might have to re-log before, before you get them. But you can use hatchbreaker limpets to grab them if you want. The sensors are an item that can be found at any damaged mega ship, even pirate attacked ones, and so it might be nothing. But they could still be placed deliberately as well for some story reason. And so some of the possibilities if they are deliberately planted are that the Thargoids themselves drop them after taking out the ship, maybe to monitor the ships that would come to investigate, and this would fit in with their apparent reconnaissance operations in California and Colsac and the belief by many that they're testing and evaluating us. But I think we can rule this one out because the sensors are in the cargo bays and it seems highly unlikely that the Thargoids would go to the trouble of specifically putting them in there. Another possibility, the Kingfisher took them to attract the Thargoids' attention, but this doesn't seem right either. Not only is it common knowledge that carrying Thargoid parts is a good way to get attacked, but even if the crew didn't know that, it makes very little sense. If you're going to talk to someone on a mission of diplomacy and peace, you don't take along bits of their bodies and ships. It's not the most tactful thing to do. The sensors were maybe planted on the ship then, to get it attacked by someone who wanted to sabotage any attempts at peace, perhaps because they're war profiteers or for some political agenda, maybe one of Dalton's opponents in Congress trying to discredit him, maybe Azimuth did it, or for some other reason that will become apparent in time. But just having the Kingfisher getting wasted is a bit simple, so some kind of twist like sabotage would be a nice touch. So with the update almost upon us, we probably won't hear much more until Tuesday or Wednesday. If something happens over the weekend, I might do a quick bit about it, but otherwise I would expect the next bit to come after Tuesday. Was the Kingfisher sabotaged? Has this set back any attempts at negotiation for the foreseeable future? What about the signal they said they got from the Stargoid just before the Thargoid escort attacked them? Nothing like that can be found at the ship, so will this come to light after some official investigation or something? Just some of the many questions that are left hanging for the moment, and we'll have to see what happens with the update. In the meantime, as always, thanks for watching. Thanks for listening and watch your backs out there.